Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Donald Minnock and I'm the Secretary of the Civil Division. Um, I'm uh, um, representing Dennis Qualley here, our Chairman, uh, for this evening's lecture. Uh, you're all very welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be able to chair and introduce uh, uh, an esteemed colleague of mine, John Fitzsimons from TII. Um, I just kind of maybe uh, do a brief overview of, of the presentation and what's to come ahead and maybe just a little bit of housekeeping um, uh, after that. So just to, to summarize, uh, John is a chartered civil engineer and he holds a master's degree in business administration and MBA. He works for Transport Infrastructure Ireland as a regional manager in the capital program section. John has over 40 years experience in the construction industry in Ireland and has worked in the private, semi-state and public sectors. Um, in terms of the presentation today, uh, it's going to be on uh, um, cognitive biases and co co cost estimation for road transport projects. Uh, the presentation will provide an overview of a research thesis undertaken for a PhD program. The objective of this research was to assess the impact, if any, of cognitive biases on the cost management processes undertaken for road transport projects in Ireland. The presentation will consider the assessment of risk, complexity, and uncertainty in construction cost forecasting, and budget management, and the processes developed by the NRA, um, and more later the TII, to mitigate these uh, factors. The research involved were quantitative and qualitative analysis, including the development of a coding framework for tracking cause and causal factors and effects. Some of the main findings of this research will be described. So um, in terms of the, the flow of the, this evening's proceedings, we'll have a presentation now of about the order of 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll arrange for some questions and answers to be, to be fielded by John afterwards. My colleague, uh, Joe Seymour, uh, our PRO will will moderate that session uh, of Q and A, which will probably take maybe ten to fifteen minutes, and uh, and then hopefully we'll have everybody on the way. We'll just do a quick wrap up and have everybody on their way. In terms of, if I could just really really emphasise when you're putting in your questions, um, in terms of uh, for our benefit and in terms of moderating of the Q and A, can you please try and avoid putting them into the chat and put them into actually the Q and A dialog box that you see right beside us. Um, because uh, it'll just make, make life easier for us to kind of um, get through them and uh, coordinate things with John. So without further ado then, I'll just I'll hand over to John. Thank you, Donald, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is John Fitzsimons. Um, this presentation, which I'm going to give this evening, will provide some insight into the difficulties associated with cost estimation and the presence of bias. I have about 35 slides to get through, and I should be able to cover them, as Donald has said, in about 40 to 45 minutes. There's three sections to the presentation. Uh, in the first section, I'm going to describe some of the concepts surrounding bias and error. In the second section, I will outline the methodology which I used for the basis of my research in order to test these concepts. And in the final section, I'll summarize some of the findings of my research. Donald is already giving you uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a professional chartered engineer. I've over 40 years experience in the industry in Ireland. I've worked in contracting. I've worked for various local authorities. I've worked in the semi-state sector and in the area of surveying and computer modeling. And most recently, I've been working for the last number of years with the National Roads Authority, Transport Infrastructure Ireland. With the NRA, I have over 20 years experience in the planning and delivery of major national road projects in Ireland, including the full section of the M9 motorway between Kilcullen and Warnford, and sections of the M1 motorway and the M11 motorway, and various other road projects and public-private partnership schemes. In terms of the background to this research, the research formed part of a four-year program of study leading to the award of Doctor of Governance. The program covered areas such as modern state and government, policy and implementation, economics, innovation, regulation, corporate governance and research. 
The presentation tonight will provide an overview of the research which I've done and will cover some but not all aspects of this work. The central research question which I asked was, is there any evidence of cognitive bias and in particular overconfidence in the cost estimates and forecasts prepared for national road projects? And has this bias led to cost overruns on these projects? Why is this particular question important? Well, as we all know, the proper management of public funding is an essential requirement for any public sector agency. And cost overruns can lead to funding deficits both within and across government departments. And because this is an academic work, I want to also to contribute to the knowledge base. Based on my own research of the literature, I believe that there was a gap existing on the actuality of project delivery and that this necessitated some detailed qualitative analysis. In terms of bias and error, it's important that we don't confuse the concept of bias with error. And I'm using error here in the broader sense of, of human mistakes, which are generally accepted to be random occurrences. And we need to distinguish between cognitive bias and human error, and also the need as professionals for professional skill, care and diligence on all of the projects that we manage. Bias, such as overconfidence, may prevail if it's not challenged. And there's also a propensity for human error to occur in calculations and design assumptions, but these can be offset by quality control systems and independent checks. And we all know that we work in a busy environment and the decisions that we make and take are made within constraints of limited time, resources and knowledge. And this is known as a satisficing environment. And unfortunately, we all work in that environment. The key work on cost forecasting and intuitive prediction was done by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky in the 1970s. And their research was initially prepared for the US Department of Defense to improve the decision-making. And it was later published in 1979. And they found as part of their research that forecasts which ignore available historical data are likely to be overconfident and that we tend as individuals to produce forecasts which are unrealistically close to best case scenarios. In simple, we, we, we tend to believe that everything is going to turn out as we've planned it. And they proposed that errors of judgment were systematic rather than random occurrences. And the remedy that they proposed in their paper from 1979 was to use a body of distributional data from similar projects which had been completed. And within the paper, they proposed a five-step methodology which effectively formed the basis for reference class forecasting. Essentially, they were saying that the best way to forecast future events is to examine their occurrence on past projects. However, they warned that the consideration of distributional data doesn't guarantee the accuracy of forecasts. However, it will provide protection against unrealistic predictions. And in this regard, what they said was that it will get the cost estimate into the right ballpark. And in their 1979 paper, they referred to this as an external view or an external perspective. Hanuman and Dan Lovello continued to develop the early research and they later applied it to the business world. And they examined decision-making that was being taken by managers in business. And they asked the question of whether 
these managers were taking reasonable risk taking or whether they were embarking on delusional optimism. And they found as managers that we tend to exaggerate the degree of control we have over the events associated with our projects and that we often sometimes discount luck or even chance. And they went on to say that any complex project would be prone to a myriad of problems which cannot be foreseen at the outset. Although I, I would question whether that is always true, whether nothing can ever be foreseen at the outset. In their later papers, they changed their terminology from an external view to an outside view, but essentially the methodology, the five-step reference class forecast remained the same. And that objective was, again, to get to the right ballpark with the cost estimate. So when we say that this outside view will get us to the right ballpark, effectively what we're saying is that a reference class forecast might suggest that perhaps we add maybe 20 or 25% to all tender sums, but it's not giving us any detail as to why these additional costs are occurring. So while reference class forecasts are extremely beneficial, without the detail, sometimes it can actually be difficult to mitigate against the possibility of that 25% actually occurring on our projects. In terms of the influences on cost estimation and the approach that I took, I believe that there is at least four major influences that are working on the accuracy of cost forecasts. There's risk, there's project complexity, there's uncertainty, and then operating in the background behind all of that are the biases that influence our assumptions and our decisions. Usually our, our base cost estimate that we associate with the design can be reliably determined, but forecasting outturn costs is made more difficult by these factors. And we need to understand and distinguish between each of these factors. Project risks are generally known to experienced project teams, particularly on repetitive projects such as roads. Complexity will differ from project to project, and this can encompass the technical and contractual issues associated with the project. For example, is the design solution appropriate and is it buildable? Has the design and the specification been translated accurately to the contract documents? What are the critical interdependencies that exist on the project? And can the project be built by a one contract one contract or form of contract. Uncertainty relates to elements which have not been built on projects before. So it may be a particular element that we haven't built previously. It may not be the full project, but it may be a part of the project where we lack data or we lack previous experience. For example, if we were to build a major new suspension bridge, would we in TII have any detailed data on previous outturns in order to advise us in terms of any mit mitigation or risk assessment that we might carry out? And then finally, as I have said, this bias may influence any assumptions that we might make about all of these factors. Trying to predict future events is challenging, but it's not impossible. And in general, in terms of both risk and uncertainty, we can categorize both of these based on our ability and our confidence to predict the outcome. So for example, if we look at this table and we look at risk category two, in this category, our view is that we can assign objective probabilities to a range of known future events on the basis of statistical data. And this would form the basis of a normal quantified risk assessment. 
However, as we start to get into the area of uncertainty where we lack data, perhaps a new bridge or a new tunnel that we haven't built before. And if we look at uncertainty, uncertainty category one, now we may have a known range of possible future events, but we lack the data necessary to assign these objective probabilities. And we may have to resort to scenario planning to try and see what might be the impact of any particular design solution that we might have on a particular project. In terms of risk category two, a quantified risk assessment, it's important to realize two key criteria there. One is that the risks are known, and secondly, that our assessment is objective. And to make our assessments objective, we need data, we need historical data. It's worth just reflecting on the evolution of systems in the National Roads Authority since its establishment in 1993. The first roads program was delivered between the period 1994 to 1999. And this road program was essentially delivered using the old engineers of Ireland, employer design, remeasurable contracts, which had full price variation clauses. So there were two key risks there that were being retained by the client during this period. We had the design risk, and we also had the measurement risk in that we took full responsibility for preparing the bill of quantities that would eventually be priced by the contractors. There was a major review of this first program of works carried out by the controller and auditor general, and they prepared and issued a report in 1999, which criticized some of the outturns from that first program. Shortly after that, we had the launch of the major national development plan between the period 2000 and 2006. And this plan had a major change in government policy which allowed the NRA to move from a bypass strategy where we envisaged bypasses of towns and connections back to the existing network to developing route corridors end to end for the first time. Simultaneously in 2000 and arising from the controller and auditor general's report, we established our new cost management unit in the NRA. And we started for the first time to look seriously at what historical data that we had available on contracts. We developed simple percentage uplifts to apply to various forms of contract, whether they were remeasurable contracts or whether they were design build. And we started to prepare simple spreadsheets in order to aid with the cost estimation process. In tandem with that, we moved to new forms of contract, including design build, early contractor involvement and the NEC contracts with limited price variation and the design risk now transferring over to the contractor. And that period led up to the introduction of the first version of the cost management manual, which was published in consultation format in 2007, and the introduction of formalized risk management procedures in the NRA, quantified risk assessments, and then eventually leading to the introduction of the new public works contracts around about the same time. I think most people are familiar with this type of table, which outlines the delivery of projects through various stages and gateways. And the NRA has always used project phases to manage the delivery of our schemes. And the reason for this is that we know that cost estimates will evolve and change over the full project life cycle. And project stages and project gateways are generally accepted as the best practice for client authorities to control and reassess costs, to change project scope at various intervals, or even to halt projects pending full reviews. It also provides opportunities to fix and formally approve cost budgets at appropriate stages. And within the National Roads Authority, we always use two critical stages to review and formally approve budgets. 
The first being at the phase three, phase four stage, where we fix and formally approve our first total scheme budget. And this forms the basis of seeking approval to publish our statutory orders and to engage in the first major period of land acquisition and real allocation of cost. And our second formal adaptation of a budget will normally occur at the phase five, phase six stage when we have a tender and we're fixing our budget prior to starting the construction phase and the major expenditure associated with that construction stage. Within the literature, there's many different interpretations of this figure. And you may have seen this type of figure illustrated before. The overall objective is to establish a cost forecast which captures the base cost estimate, the known risks and the unknown risks and the uncertainty. The base cost estimate will normally become more accurate and increase as the design and the project specification is completed. And normally the first time when we can genuinely sign off on having an accurate base cost estimate is when the design is actually complete. And that would normally occur in the NRA at the phase three stage. The known risks can be monetized through a quantified risk assessment, which captures the band shaded in yellow. And then the unknown risks and any uncertainty can either be captured through an additional optimism bias adjustment or a reference class forecast. The objective, as Kahneman has always said, is to be in the right ballpark and to establish a budget estimate which is unlikely to be exceeded rather than generating an absolutely precise cost estimate. And normally at our phase five contract award stage, when we're setting our total scheme budget, we would aim to set what's known as a P80 confidence level. And that would be to set a budget that would generally only be exceeded in 20% of cases. In terms of assigning risk contingencies, there's no absolute method that can be used that will give you a guaranteed perfect budget. And the choice of methods will depend on the size of the project. And multiple methods can be used, and some of them can be used as checks. We could start off with either a simple percentage uplift and that would have been used in the early stages of scheme development in the early 2000s in the NRA, when we use simple uplifts to apply to either design build contracts or remeasurable contracts. And these can be used in conjunction with simple spreadsheets in order to aid the estimation process. However, it's more normal to use a quantified risk assessment which would be a rigorous assessment of all known and expected risks using a full Monte Carlo simulation. As I've said earlier, this involves a probability-based risk assessment. However, the danger is that in the absence of specific data, it can become a subjective assessment. An optimism bias adjustment can also be used and that can be used in conjunction with a quantified risk assessment in order to capture any outstanding risks or uncertainty. Finally, a reference class forecast can also be used. And the advantage of the reference class forecast is that it's a totally objective assessment of both known and unknown risks. As I said earlier, the reference class forecast will always be objective but it may not always provide the cause and reasoning. So there's no learning experience associated with a reference class forecast. And we also need to carefully consider the sample that we're going to use as the basis for the reference class forecast and also the parameter that we're going to assess. In other words, what 
percentage are we actually going to apply the reference class forecast to? Is it going to be applied to the base cost estimate? Is it going to be applied to the tender estimate? Or is it going to be applied to other parameters that we feel are important and which advises the cost estimation process? The whole process is further complicated by the delivery through temporary multi-organizations. And these can vary from quite simple structures to quite complex governance structures. And these temporary multi-organizations are brought together for a limited time period in the delivery of an infrastructure project. And the simple structure that I have outlined here, which applies to road projects, would consist of both the NRA, TII, a local authority, and possibly two or even three local authorities, depending on the extent of the scheme. The National Road Project Office, which would be responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the scheme. All of the technical advisors and specialist consultants involved in the project. The contractor or contractors who may be involved in joint venture. And all of the other third parties who may issue permits and approvals. For example, either CIE or ESB Networks or AirGrid. And all of the various landowners, communities and the general public who are impacted by our schemes. And finally, on board Planala, who sits and has an independent role in issuing planning consents and decisions on our projects. Some of these actors may have different and conflicting interests, and this can have consequences for the outcome costs and also for the program for delivery. And also personalities and relationships can be influential, particularly at the phase six construction stage. In the second half of the presentation, I'm just gonna outline the methodology which I use to test some of these concepts as part of my own research. I identify the sample of completed road projects for analysis and I carried out both quantitative and qualitative analysis on this sample of road projects. And for the qualitative analysis, I developed a detailed coding framework to examine project data in a structured manner. And I defined a series of data variables over the full project life cycle that I could use to analyze a series of case studies. In terms of the quantitative analysis, I examined the cost estimates against the outturns for a sample of 44 road projects. And I analyzed the distribution of both cost underspends and overspends for this sample. I also examined the variability of unit costs for various road types, but I won't go into this as part of the presentation this evening. The main sample of road projects which I put together for the research consisted of 44 road projects which were planned and delivered in the period from 1999 to 2015 and involved various forms of contract for their delivery. There were 20 dual carriageway and motorway projects. Generally, all of these would be in a new build environment and generally in a rural situation. There were 19 single carriageway projects, again, generally new build and in a rural environment. Three upgrade projects, which involved upgrades to existing dual carriageway or motorway schemes, bringing them up to three lanes in each direction with associated junction improvements and then two standalone junction improvement projects. The cost comparisons which I made, I made three cost comparisons. Firstly, I compared the construction outturn cost against the risk adjusted construction cost estimate. And I refer to this as the target construction cost. So this effectively is the base construction cost 
plus all of the risk contingencies. I then made a comparison between the construction outturn cost and the tender costs at the initial award, because I wanted to look at what was happening between the tenders and the outturn also. And then finally, looking at all of the cost headings, not just construction cost, I made a comparison between the total scheme outturn cost and the total scheme budgets for each of the projects. If we just look initially at the comparison between the outturn construction costs and the target construction cost, and if we leave aside for a moment Project 40 at the right-hand side of the slide, we can see that there's a relatively even distribution of underspends and overspends. And if we come back to Kahneman's seminal paper from 1979, where he argued that in order to provide evidence for bias, there should be a systematic evidence for that bias. We can see on this slide that there is no evidence for systematic bias, but there is a relatively even, under, a relatively even distribution of both underspends and overspends. In terms of the comparisons on the target construction cost, which are illustrated in the orange-red color, the mean uplift was approximately 3%, so not too far from zero. However, if we look at the blue bars, the comparison on the tenders, we can see that there is an uplift on almost every project, which is not unusual. And the mean uplift on the initial tender sums I found to be in the order of plus 25%. Now that's not unusual and not to be unexpected given that the form of contracts that we use would allow for both compensation events and normal variations. This is just looking at the data in a slightly different way. And again, looking at the distributions of cost overruns and underspends. And if we look at the middle body of the slide, we can see that there's a reasonably good distribution of projects between the minus 20% band and the plus 20% band on the target construction cost comparison. So from the 44 project, from the 44 projects that I analyzed, 41 of the projects fall within that range. And you can see from the graph that there's a reasonably good even distribution again of underspends and overspends. And this it would indicate that the construction cost contingencies that have been applied as part of these projects are reasonable and are commensurate with the risk that we would expect as part of these projects. As you would have seen from that last slide, there is an uplift on almost every tender sum, and that's not to be unexpected. And this whole area of risk transfer and risk pricing is still a contentious issue. There has been a significant body of research undertaken in this area by the International Transport Forum. And they have made a number of recommendations that could be considered by clients and by TII and the NRA. Some of those would be perhaps to share our fully costed risk register with all of the tenders at the tender stage. Another consideration might be to have a more even risk sharing for certain changes or events that we would believe would be outside the control of the contractor. So for example, we might build in a 50-50 split of risk sharing for certain events that we believe perhaps are outside the control of the contractor. Fundamentally, it comes down to this question of whether it is realistic for contractors to price all risks in a competitive procurement market. And sometimes as part of contracts, we leave them with challenges dealing with third parties who issue permits and approvals. And we also have, unfortunately, the ever present issue of underground services and the need for comprehensive records of those underground services and who should take responsibility 
for pulling together and maintaining all of that critical data. We also need to be aware of external factors and no more so than that now in 2022. But if you look at the period for which I carried out this research between 1999 and 2015, we had two major events that had a major influence on tenders within that period. And if you look at this figure, which follows three indices, we have the blue line, which is following the construction cost index, which was put together by the Society of Chartered Surveyors of Ireland, and the gray line, which is the harmonized index of consumer prices. You can see that over the period from 2005 to 2016, both of those indexes are gradually increasing. Inflation during that period wasn't actually excessive. But if you look at the critical red orange line, the tender price index, you can see there's a major divergence between the tenders that were being bid at that time and the normal increases in labor and materials. And you can see a gradual increase in all three indices up to about 2007, where we experienced the first major shock, which resided in Ireland, and that was the collapse of the Irish property and residential property market, which started around about 2007. And unfortunately, that was followed shortly afterwards in 2008 by the collapse of layman's and the global economic crisis that ensued after that. And that left us in a period where there was little investment in public infrastructure during that period from 28 to about 2014. And that put critical downward pressure on the tenders that were actually being bid during that period. And this becomes a fundamental question. If we are using the tender as being the base cost estimate at the contract award stage. And we have to ask the question always of whether the tender that we receive really reflects the real value of the work that's been bid at that particular point in time. And certainly during that period, there would have been a question raised as to whether some of those tenders mightn't have reflected the real value of work. In terms of the final cost comparison, where we take all of the construction cost headings, not just construction cost, this slide illustrates a comparison between the total scheme budgets and the total outturn costs. Again, as you can see, there's very, very good correlation between the outturn cost and our total scheme budgets that we're developing for these road projects. And in actual fact, on the 44 road projects that I looked at, the total scheme budget was only exceeded in seven cases, which represented only 16% of the sample. So again, even when we look at all of the cost headings, we're doing a lot right in the NRA TII. In terms of the qualitative analysis, I prepared a new detailed coding framework as part of my research to examine a subset of six road projects. And these essentially became six mini case studies. I had four new build projects and two upgrade projects. And I used my detailed coding framework to examine the causal factors that were giving rise to the additional or increased costs. The coding framework that I developed established a standard methodology for tracking projects by type, for looking at all of the various cost varies, variances that arose on the projects, and also for assigning aspects of complexity and level of uncertainty to the six projects that I looked at and also identifying and tracking risks through the projects, through the various phases. This coding framework provided a standard methodology for analyzing the qualitative data. 
And I defined approximately 19 key variables to track the data, all of the risks, and all of the costs associated over the full project life cycle. And this coding framework provides a foundation for a more detailed analysis of a larger sample set of projects. And it can also be expanded to cover other types of infrastructure projects. In terms of trying to assign complexity and uncertainty, I prepared a, a simple procedure for assigning both complexity and uncertainty. And if you look at this table, for example, in the case of a project that would have low complexity, I assigned that to a standard new build road project that would have no new Ute features and would generally be in a rural environment. And that would extend to a project that would have high complexity, which might be a road project with a unique bridge or a tunnel element, or perhaps an urban road project or an upgrade with extensive traffic management and many existing services. Similarly, in terms of trying to assign uncertainty, I would have assigned a low uncertainty to projects where we could use our statistical probability to assign uncertainty and a high uncertainty to again projects that would have these unique elements where there's use of novel technology or processes or we lacked any experience of either this particular type of project or this construction element. The methodology that I proposed can also be expanded. So it will allow for the need for multiple contracts where there are some or many interdependencies. As I said earlier in the presentation, we're possibly unique in the NRA that we can deliver most of our projects through a single contract, single contractor form of contract. But on very, very large international projects, that's not always the case. Critical path delivery can be connected across different contracts, and there can also be multiple disciplines involved in the delivery of the project, including not only civil, but electrical and power systems, mechanical systems, computer and information technology systems integration. There can also be supply chain management issues and dependencies. Often we can specify products that are possibly not available in Ireland and have to be sourced on the international market. And then obviously there are complexities associated with very, very large underground structures that will be associated with rail or metro stations or very, very large tunneling works. Assigning these type of cost contingencies for this higher level of complexity, it can be difficult and it also involves and may involve scenario planning. I won't go into too much detail on this slide. I just wanted to leave it there, but in terms of going to that higher level of complexity, one current example of that is the Crossrail Elizabeth Line, which is currently being delivered in London at the moment. This is a project that has 36 main contracts with various interdependencies throughout all of those contracts and multiple activities running in parallel. So effectively, the possibility for a domino effect is going to be high where there's multiple contracts and delay and disruption costs can be multiplied from one contract across to all contracts. In terms of tracking risks and additional costs, again, I proposed a relatively simple proposal within my research, and I grouped risks within seven main headings, and I, allow, I was able to use that risk categorization to track the risks and the additional costs through the six case studies which I looked at. So for example, one group might be group one, which would be scope changes made during the project life cycle. 
And group two might be known risks which occurred. Or group three might be any issues associated with project complexity. So it simply provides a structure whereby risks can be tracked right from phase one and right through phases three when the design is complete, phase five through the development of your tenders, and then phase six and phase seven when you're actually out on site and any of these risks and additional costs materialize. The beauty of this type of system is that this provides the data for future risk assessments and it brings real objectivity to the risk assessment process and removes the need for any subjective assessment. Again, in terms of sampling risks within the case studies that I analyzed, this type of table brings up the frequency of risks that occurred and it allows you then to use that frequency to generate the probability for any future risk assessment. And again, as I have said, within road projects, most of the risks tend to be obvious to the project team. So on this sample of six projects that I looked at, if you look at some of the top risks that did eventually materialize and were tracked through the process, on the six mini studies, scope changes occurred on all six of the projects, which is not unusual. However, if you look at some of the others, they are quite obvious to us involved in road projects. There were four occurrences where access to the site was denied or prevented. Four of the projects ended up in some form of dispute resolution, which would seem to suggest differences of opinion in terms of risk transfer and risk pricing. Four were associated with diversions of services and utilities. Again, not unusual, but a very, very difficult to deal with, very, very difficult area to deal with, particularly for contractors. And four associated with consents and approvals for third parties or where there were changes in their requirements. In the final part of the presentation, I'm just going to summarize some of the main findings which I drew from my understanding and my application of my research through the process. I found no evidence of systematic cost overruns, but I did find an even distribution of underspends and overruns. I also found that most of the risks that materialized were known to experienced project managers but this might be particular to roads projects. I also found that the risk contingencies that were assigned, which became the target construction costs, were generally adequate and were commensurate with the risk that was expected. In terms of the contribution to the knowledge, I believe that the coding framework that I developed provides a foundation for the examination of a larger sample of road projects and can also be developed for other road transport projects, including public transport. The data variables which I developed can be expanded to examine a wider range of transport projects. Also, the qualitative analysis and the qualitative assessment that I carried out illustrates the actuality of project implementation. And I believe it bridges a gap between the statistical analysis and the actuality of project delivery. In terms of the lessons learned and continuous improvement, how do we ensure that this learning experience is active and dynamic? We need to make sure that all of the reports that we generate, all of the lessons learned reports and the project closeout reports are actively reviewed and re-examined in conjunction with current risk assessments. We need to make sure that all of this data that's available to us doesn't simply reside in a filing cabinet or on a server. We also need to make sure that there's retention of knowledge and experience. And in terms of the temporary multi-organizations that we bring together, these organizations are temporary. And we need to make sure that all of the temporary project staff 
that we bring together are somehow retained in our system and that all of the various people that we bring together have some kind of a defined career and advancement path within the industry, particularly those staff that are out on site during the phase six construction stage. We need to continue building our relationships with third parties. And we need to make sure that we bring them on board as early as possible within the project development stage and that they understand what's required of them in the delivery of our schemes. And we need to build these central databases of project data and to maintain them because this provides the data which will feed into our future risk assessments and will also give us real data in order to assess cost impacts. In the absence of these databases, any workshops that we have for delivering risk assessments will end up being subjective and we need to try to avoid that where possible. In terms of some conclusions, additional costs can and will arise on road projects for a variety of reasons, most of which I believe are known. I also believe that cost escalation can be mitigated through risk assessment and through the assignments of contingencies. And in terms of Canman's inside or external view, I believe that risk assessment for road projects can be project specific. In other words, quantified risk assessments are still appropriate. Repetitive linear road projects, I think, lend themselves to the inside view. And the project specific quantified risk assessments is adequate for risk assessments. However, as complexity and uncertainty increases, a reference class forecast can and should be used as a check and it reinforces this outside view. In terms of some concluding thoughts, we mustn't forget that infrastructure projects are not delivered in a factory controlled environment. It's not as simple as determining all of our inputs and defining our unit costs. The environment that we operate in is dynamic and changing, and it's often difficult to work in. However, I still believe that the inside view, the project specific quantified risk assessment is still valid for routine repetitive projects such as roads. We must be aware of external factors. And this is critical if, as the current case, that we use the tender estimate as the base cost estimate at the phase six tender award stage. And I cannot overemphasize the final point, the constant need for attention to detail and to use all available data available to us to assist us in the decision-making process. Thank you. Thanks for that, John. Um, that's a very, very informative presentation there, a lot of data. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, very comprehensive. I think even from my own perspective, working for TI as well, it just goes to kind of reinforces in your own mind that that uh, the complexity of, of what we have to manage in terms of dealing with our contracts and our procurement processes and the development of products, but also the, I suppose, the advantage or the benefit that TI has that we can iteratively review and assess and, and, and parse and analyze the multitude of projects that are that are within our portfolio over a comprehensive period of time to constantly improve and, and refine our approaches. And I suppose it, it does then kind of maybe beg the question as to how, is there an opportunity to transpose all that experience and kind of tact and uh, knowledge to other departments or other sectors that get landed with them or bestowed upon them the development of super projects that kind of come along once in a lifetime. But I guess I think that 
that that kind of topic might be touched on in the Q&A later on, actually. So um, look, at, thanks to everybody for uh, uh, <laughs> abiding by the housekeeping rules. And I see there's a few questions in there in the Q&A. So I'll, I'll just hand over to my colleague, uh, Joe Seymour, then who'll just uh, uh, um, uh, moderate on, on the Q&A for now. Thank you. Okay, the first question is from Ashling Reynolds. In your opinion, which factor has a greater e effect on improving the reliability of cost overrun estimates in the early 2000s? Establishing and improving the cost estimate, uh, cost management unit in the NRA are changing the form of contract with more risk transfer to the contractor. I suppose two major things happened at, at the same time. Which do you think influenced the outcomes? Um, it's a, a good question, Joe. Um, I, I, I think there, there's no doubt that the choice of contracts that were used by the NRA at the outset of the National Development Plan in 2000 was a major change in, in risk transfer. Um, it, it protected us from two main criteria which we were exposed to in the previous period. Uh, and, I, and I wouldn't underestimate both of those. There's the design risk associated with the project and then there's the fundamental risk that would have been associated with the production of major bills of quantities. I mean, I, I, I can remember some of the projects that we were delivering between the period 1994 to 1999. And I mean, even the, the bill of quantities going back to what would have been the old method of measurement for roadworks at the time would have been voluminous. Uh, bills of quantities probably would have been broken up into or perhaps 10 to 15 sections. And, you know, on those old remeasurable contracts, the, the designers and the local authorities were taking full responsibility for the accuracy of the bill of quantities and for the takeoff of that quant that, those quantities, which, you know, formed the basis upon which the contractors priced those contracts. So inevitably the change to design build was a, was a major advantage to the authority during that period. But, but I think in, in hand with that, there, there, there was a recognition um, and it was recorded in the Controller and Auditor General's report in 1999 that what we were doing, we, we possibly hadn't regularized what we were doing. Um, what, while we were analyzing outturn costs within that period, we, we didn't have a formal process and we didn't have dedicated staff going back to 2000, 2001 to assist us in that process. And while there would have been an initial examination of some of the projects delivered during that period for the road need study, and we would have produced um, outturn costs per kilometer for various road types, um, with the establishment of the cost estimation unit, it, it put us in a position where we could start to analyze that data in a more formal basis. We could look at the different forms of contract, whether they were remeasurable, uh, whether it was the modified FIDIC contract, um, whether it was an ECI contract or an NEC contract. And we could look at developing individual uplifts for those projects. So I think it was a combination of two factors, Joe. I think it was inevitable, both of them assisted in the process. You wouldn't you wouldn't lean on either of them. Both of them were just as important as each other, Nelly. At the oh, time, I think so. well timed. Definitely, I think so. Yeah. You know, I, you know, if you think back to like even if we even if we look at using contracts where the employer designs, and and I know within the new suite of public works contracts. The bill of quantities is there to assist the production of the lump sum, but inevitably the contractor relies that. And, you know, the onus is still on a, a local authority and their designers to produce a reasonably accurate structure to enable the contractor to, to price. You know, the contractor prices within a limited time frame, and I think that's the difficulty. And if, if, if they don't have a, a good framework or a good structure to price, there is a danger that that, that accuracy is lost. Yeah, okay. This, this uh, from Michael Collins from UCD. Do you think your conclusions were influenced by the scale of the economic crash in 2008, 2011? Uh, and do, you, do these skew the findings on the cost estimates? 
No, I no, they, they wouldn't have any impact on the, the cost estimates. Um, I was merely trying to illustrate the, the difficulty of using the tender cost estimates as the base cost estimate. And you know that that's contained within our cost management manual at the moment. It it just means you have to be aware of the the circumstances and the factors that that might be prevalent at the time when a project is being tendered, and and be aware of some of the external influences that might be there within the industry that that might align contractors into a certain pricing strategy at that time. And if you go back to that period between 2008 and 2014, there was very, very little public infrastructure being procured at that time. And whatever public infrastructure was being procured, it meant that any of the tenders and contractors who were trying to win that work were under additional pressures to win that work, which they probably didn't need. Yeah. Okay. Did the outturn come close enough to your original cost estimates? Yeah, generally the, the, the cost contingencies that we have been applying in the NRA have generally been, as I've said, commensurate with the risk that, that we would expect. Okay. Ashling Reynolds again. What lessons can be derived from your research for the more efficient management of one-off large-scale infrastructure provision in Ireland, particularly where organisations do not have the history and experience of TII? I think that's a quite an important point because it, it, the one advantage TII has is they're really good at doing delivering these roads and have huge experience in them. And that can't be said for all sectors or uh, all project offices that are set up. Well, do you feel that that impacts yeah, the that's, learnings? Um, I suppose if you, when I tried to use the slide to illustrate how the systems evolved in the NRA, I was, I suppose, trying to suggest that, you know, putting in place these type of governance systems and control systems doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, for any agencies that are embarking on delivering major capital infrastructure projects for the first time, there's no doubt that, that agencies like TII can, can assist, you know, the body of experience and the documentation that, that we can make available. There's no doubt that that, that, that will assist. But again, each, each agency has to start. You, you have to start from ground zero. And I suppose the easiest way to start is to look internally in each organization to see what is the information that's available. And almost every organization is going to have um, some body of documentation available in terms of all of the tenders that it would have received over a period of time. Hopefully there's going to be some what we would generally call a closeout port or report or some kind of report, even a final account report that would summarize where, where, where the outturn actually went. And even starting to make comparisons between what came in a tender stage and what was recorded in either the final account report or the project closeout report is the first step. You start to analyze small elements of data and then you build them up into much larger samples. And then that allows you to apply, you know, procedures like Excel analysis or database analysis yeah. to make better judgments. But but it is a slow process, Joe. It, yeah. It's impossible to make it happen overnight. And Michael Nolan has just mentioned something there on, 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 on the chat. And it is you had all the information available. Yeah. In your PhD and looking around, did you see if other organizations have that level of data in the Irish market that would help them get better cost estimates in the long run? Yeah, I think there's no doubt that that, that information is available. And, and certainly when I reviewed the, the academic research, um, and that was the one reason why I why I brought in the qualitative research. There is a lot of academic statistical analysis out there. So in terms of analyzing outturns, there, there's quite a lot of data there on various types of infrastructure projects. The problem can sometimes be that it's very, very heavy on the statistics. So while it might give you the kind of direction towards where your, where your ballpark should be, in other words, should I add X percent to a tender or should I add X percent to a base cost estimate? It may not actually give you the detail behind that, but, but there is a, there's a lot of academic research out there. 
Okay. Craig West asks a good question. At which project phase does TII communicate an estimated project total cost externally, either to the government or public? And it's come up variations in that price or that question a few times. Yeah, the, we, have, we have regularized our procedures now. And uh, in accordance with our current procedures, our first total scheme budget is normally announced just before we seek approval for phase four. So it's just before we lodge our submission with on board Planala. Yeah. And the basis of that is ideally your design should be complete at that stage. You should have a very, very good working specification. You should have a pretty good schedule of quantities upon which to base your base cost estimate. You should have your risk assessment complete and your quantified risk assessment and your risk contingencies. Plus, you'll also have a substantial amount of information on the land and property that's impacted, the amount of landowners associated, the extent of property in terms of area that's going to be acquired. So that's the first time you're really in a position to be able to say, yeah, I can honestly hold my hand on my heart and stand over my total scheme budget. Yeah. But I suppose it's it's fighting off the government and things like that to not announce it before that point. That's that, that's the challenge. Absolutely. Uh, but we shouldn't be we shouldn't be afraid to qualify any of the estimates that we produce. You know, and if you go back to when we're at maybe phase one at concept stage, and we might just have a lent and a unit cost. You know, if we are asked by government to make those cost estimates available, we should be upfront by saying that these are basic estimates, you know, and, and they're purely based on a lent and a cost, a unit cost estimate with a high with a high risk contingency. Yeah, understood. And last one from Brendan Finn. For urban proje projects, especially those the coming decade, we all know there's going to be a lot of projects for both TII and on my own side, the NTA. Uh, how serious do you think the risks will be for a change of scope by the client during the project life and a change of scope or methods of demand is by interest groups or enforced through courts? Um, th these are challenging projects. You said it yourself. Urban projects are more complex. Uh, there's a demand for changes to be made even when you've got planning or for uh, at a later stage um how do you think they're dealt with or how how can you get them included in your uh, risk at the start of the project yeah i mean all you can do at the at the phase three phase four stage is to include as many of these risks and unplanned events as possible and to cost them but we have to remember that the budget is there to guide us. So the fact that we, we, we might prepare a budget that might say Project X is going to cost 500 million euros. That's simply saying that we, we, we may end up at 500 million euros. We're not saying that we want to spend 500 million euros. And associated with every project, we have to establish a governance system and a control system that allows us to evaluate scope changes and allow us to evaluate each of them on a case by case basis. So for example, post planning or during the phase five preparation of tender documents, if an item comes up for whatever reason and uh, a suggestion is made that a particular junction type should be changed, then that has to be assessed in the light of what benefits it might bring to the project, whether the budget is actually available, and whether we want to make that decision at that stage. Because if you remember, if, if, we, if we allow too many changes at the start of phase six, at the start of the construction stage, we may actually use up all of our budget within the first six to 12 months of perhaps a four or a five year project. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that comes back to the governance structure that's established and whatever methodology is adopted between all of the key stakeholders to assess in an individual change orders and scope changes on a case by case basis. Okay, I think that's it, Dal. Thank you very much, John, excellent. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and and um, sorry, no, we couldn't get to all the questions and answers. We were just trying to keep keep your time. So, uh, Lucas, 
I think we've covered a lot of ground tonight. It was a very comprehensive presentation that was reflected by the very stimulating questions and the uh, uh, discussion and feedback from, from John. So thanks to everybody for attending and for participating. Uh, uh, yet again, we've had a great attendance on this platform. Just if I can take a quick sneaky opportunity then just to plug uh, our next uh, civil division event is on next Monday evening at half five. It's another TI uh, presentation on the Motorway Operations Control Centre development. Uh, um, that, that's housed down at the Dublin Total Admin Building. So some publicity will be going out in that uh, later on this week. So I think um, uh, with that, we might draw things to a, a conclusion. And yeah, and once again, John, I'd just like to thank you for your endeavours and good luck in closing out the the, the doctors and uh, getting your conferral and, and whatnot. Just to say, because we, 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 we can preempt that people will be looking for a copy of the slide deck. Uh, I think um, the plan is that uh, in due course, we should be in a position to make available the copy of the slide deck. But I just, I, I, I think there's a little bit of, um, uh, at your end, you have to go through the proper channels of, of close note your submissions to, to, the, to the college. And, and after that, you'd be in a position maybe to share it. Is that right? That's no problem at all, Donald. Yeah, I just want to close out the process of uh, getting the dissertation lodged on the open portal in UCD, and then I'll make everything available. Great. So by all means, submit your requests to, to myself yeah. or Maureen or Joe, and we'll, we'll keep tabs on them. And then as soon as we can, we'll release the slide deck. OK. All right. So uh, well, thanks, everybody. And uh, good evening to you and stay safe. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Donald. Thank you.